on the study of zoology by Thomas H. Huxley. Natural history is the name familiarly applied to the study of the properties of such natural bodies as minerals, plants, and animals. The sciences which embody the knowledge man has acquired upon these subjects are commonly termed natural sciences. In contradistinction to other so-called physical sciences, and those who devote themselves especially to the pursuit of such sciences have been and are commonly termed naturalists. Linnaeus was a naturalist in this wide sense, and his Systema Natura was a work upon natural history in the broadest acceptation of the term. In it, that great methodizing spirit embodied all that was known in his time of the distinctive characters of minerals, animals, and plants. But the enormous stimulus which Linnaeus gave to the investigation of nature soon rendered it impossible that any one man should write another Systema Natura, and extremely difficult for anyone to become even a naturalist such as Linnaeus was. Great as have been the advances made by all the three branches of science, of old included under the title of natural history, there can be no doubt that zoology and botany have grown in an enormously greater ratio than mineralogy, and hence, as I suppose, the name of natural history has gradually become more and more definitely attached to these prominent divisions of the subject, and by naturalist people have meant more and more distinctly to imply a student of the structure and function of living beings. However this may be, it is certain that the advance of knowledge has generally widened the distance between mineralogy and its old associates, while it has drawn zoology and botany closer together, so that, of late years, it has been found convenient, and indeed necessary, to associate the sciences which deal with vitality and all its phenomena under the common head of biology, and the biologists have come to repudiate any blood relationship with their foster brothers, the mineralogists. Certain broad laws have a general application throughout both the animal and the vegetable worlds, but the ground common to these kingdoms of nature is not of very wide extent, and the multiplicity of details is so great that the student of living beings finds himself obligated to devote his attention exclusively either to one or the other. If he elects to study plants under any aspect, we know at once what to call him. He is a botanist, and his science is botany. But if the investigation of animal life be his choice, the name generally applied to him will vary according to the kind of animals he studies, or the particular phenomena of animal life to which he confines his attention. If the study of man is his object, he is called an anatomist, or a physiologist, or an ethnologist, 
but if he dissects animals or examines into the mode in which their functions are performed, he is a comparative anatomist or comparative physiologist. If he turns his attention to fossil animals, he is a paleontologist. If his mind is more particularly directed to the specific description, discrimination, classification, and distribution of animals, he is termed a zoologist. For the purpose of the present discourse, however, I shall recognize none of those titles save the last, which I shall employ as the equivalent of botanist, and I shall use the term zoology as denoting the whole doctrine of animal life in contradistinction to botany, which signifies the whole doctrine of vegetable life. Employed in this sense, zoology, like botany, is divisible into three great but subordinate sciences, morphology, physiology, and distribution, each of which may, to a very great extent, be studied independently of the other. Zoological morphology is the doctrine of animal form or structure. Anatomy is one of its branches, development is another, while classification is the expression of the relations which different animals bear to one another in respect of their anatomy and their development. Zoological distribution is the study of animals in relation to the terrestrial conditions which obtain now, or have obtained at any previous epoch of the Earth's history. Zoological physiology, lastly, is the doctrine of the functions of animals. It regards animal bodies as machines impelled by certain forces, and performing an amount of work which can be expressed in terms of the ordinary forces of nature. The final object of physiology is to deduce the facts of morphology, on the one hand, and those of distribution, on the other, from the laws of the molecular forces of matter. Such is the scope of zoology, but if I were to content myself with the enunciation of these dry definitions, I should ill exemplify that method of teaching this branch of physical science, which it is my chief business tonight to recommend. Let us turn away then from abstract definitions. Let us take some concrete living thing, some animal, the commoner the better, and let us see how the application of common sense and common logic to the obvious facts it presents inevitably leads us into all these branches of zoological science. I have before me a lobster. When I examine it, what appears to be the most striking character it presents? Why, I observe that this part, which we call the tail of the lobster, is made up of six distinct hard rings and a seventh terminal piece. If I separate one of the middle rings, say, the third, I find it carries upon its under surface a pair of limbs or appendages, each of which consists of a stalk and two terminal pieces, so that I can represent a transverse section of the ring and its appendages upon the diagram board in this way. Now, if I take the fourth ring, I find it has the same structure, and so have the fifth and the second 
so that in each of these divisions of the tale, I find parts which correspond to one another, a ring and two appendages, and in each appendage a stock and two end pieces. These corresponding parts are called, in the technical language of anatomy, homologous parts. The ring of the third division is the homologue of the ring of the fifth. The appendage of the former is the homologue of the appendage of the latter. And, as each division exhibits corresponding parts in corresponding places, we say that all the divisions are constructed upon the same plan. But now, let us consider the sixth division. It is similar to, and yet different from, the others. The ring is essentially the same as in the other divisions, but the appendages look at first as if they were very different, and yet, when we regard them closely, what do we find? A stalk and two terminal divisions, exactly as in the others, but the stalk is very short and very thick. The terminal divisions are very broad and flat, and one of them is divided into two pieces. I may say, therefore, that the sixth segment is like the others in plan, but that it is modified in its details. The first segment is like the others, so far as its ring is concerned and though its appendages differ from any of those yet examined in the simplicity of their structure, parts corresponding with the stem and one of the divisions of the appendages of the other segments can be readily discerned in them. Thus, it appears that the lobster's tail is composed of a series of segments which are fundamentally similar though each presents peculiar modifications of the plan common to all. But when I turn to the forepart of the body, I see, at first, nothing but a great shield-like shell, called technically the carapace, ending in front in a sharp spine, on either side of which are the curious compound eyes, set upon the ends of stout, movable stalks. Behind these, on the underside of the body, are two pairs of long feelers, or antenna, followed by six pairs of jaws folded against one another over the mouth, and five pairs of legs, the foremost of those being the great pinchers, or claws of the lobster. It looks, at first, a little hopeless to attempt to find in this complex mass a series of rings, each with its pair of appendages, as I have shown you in the abdomen, and yet it is not difficult to demonstrate their existence. Strip off the legs, and you will find that each pair is attached to a very definite segment of the underwall of the body, but these segments, instead of being the lower parts of free rings, as in the tail, are such parts of rings which are all solidly united and bound together, and the like is true of the jaws, the feelers, the eye stalks every pair of which is borne upon its own special segment. Thus, the conclusion is gradually forced upon us that the body of the lobster is composed of as many rings as there are pairs of appendages, namely twenty in all, but that the six hindmost rings remain free and movable, while the fourteen front rings, 
become firmly soldered together, their backs forming one continuous shield, the carapace. Unity of plan, diversity in execution is the lesson taught by the study of the rings of the body, and the same instruction is given still more emphatically by the appendages. If I examine the outermost jaw, I find it consists of three distinct portions, an inner, a middle, and an outer, mounted upon the common stem. And if I compare this jaw with the legs behind it, or the jaws in front of it, I find it quite easy to see that, in the legs, it is the part of the appendage which corresponds to the inner division, which becomes modified into what we know familiarly as the leg, while the middle division disappears, and the outer division is hidden under the carapace. Nor is it more difficult to discern that, in the appendages of the tail, the middle division appears again, and the outer vanishes, while, on the other hand, in the foremost jaw, the so-called mandible, the inner division only is left, and, in the same way, the parts of the feelers and of the eye stalks can be identified with those of the legs and jaws. But whither does all this tend? To the very remarkable conclusion that a unity of plan of the same kind as that discoverable in the tail or abdomen of the lobster pervades the whole organization of its skeleton, so that I can return to the diagram representing any one of the rings of the tail which I drew upon the board and by adding a third division to each appendage, I can use it as a sort of scheme or plan of any ring of the body. I can give names to all the parts of the figure, and then, if I take any segment of the body of the lobster, I can point out to you exactly what modification the general plan has undergone in that particular segment, what part has remained movable, and what has become fixed to another, what has been excessively developed and metamorphosed, and what has been suppressed. But I imagine I hear the question, how is all this to be tested? No doubt, it is a pretty ingenious way of looking at the structure of any animal, but is it anything more? Does nature acknowledge, in any deeper way, this unity of plan we seem to trace? The objection suggested by these questions is a very valid and important one, and morphology was in an unsound state so long as it rested upon the mere perception of the analogies which obtain between fully formed parts. The unchecked ingenuity of speculative anatomists proved itself fully competent to spin any number of contradictory hypotheses out of these same facts, and endlessly morphological dreams threatened to supplant scientific theory. Happily, however, there is a criterion of morphological truth, and a sure test of all homologies. Our lobster has not always been what we see it. It was once an egg, a semi-fluid mass of yolk, not so big as a pin's head, contained in a transparent membrane and exhibiting not the least trace of any one of these organs, whose multiplicity and complexity in the adult are so surprising. After a time, a delicate patch of cellular membrane appeared upon one face of this yolk, 
and that patch was the foundation of the whole creature, the clay out of which it would be molded. Gradually investing the yolk, it became subdivided by transverse constrictions into segments, the forerunners of the rings of the body. Upon the ventral surface of each of the rings thus sketched out, a pair of bud-like prominences made their appearance, the rudiments of the appendages of the ring. At first, all the appendages were alike, but, as they grew, most of them became distinguished into a stem and two terminal divisions, to which, in the middle part of the body, was added a third outer division, and it was only at the later period that by the modification or absorption of certain of these primitive constituents, the limbs acquired their perfect form. Thus, the study of development proves that the doctrine of unity of plan is not merely a fancy, that it is not merely one way of looking at the matter, but that it is the expression of deep-seated natural facts. The legs and jaws of the lobster may not merely be regarded as modifications of a common type. In fact, and in nature they are so. The leg and the jaw of the young animal being, at first, indistinguishable. These are wonderful truths, the more so because the zoologist finds them to be of universal application. The investigation of a polyp, of a snail, of a fish, of a horse, or of a man, would have led us, though by a less easy path, perhaps, to exactly the same point. Unity of plan everywhere lies hidden under the mask of diversity of structure. The complex is everywhere evolved out of the simple. Every animal has at first the form of an egg, and every animal and every organic part in reaching its adult state passes through conditions common to other animals and other adult parts. And this leads me to another point. I have hitherto spoken as if the lobster were alone in the world, but, as I need hardly remind you, there are myriads of other animal organisms of these, some, such as men, horses, birds, fishes, snails, slugs, oysters, corals, and sponges, are not in the least like the lobster, but other animals, though they may differ a good deal from the lobster, are yet either very like it, or are like something that is like it. The crayfish, the rock lobster, and the prawn and the shrimp, for example, however different, are yet so like lobsters that a child would group them as of the lobster kind, in contradistinction to snails and slugs, and these last again would form a kind by themselves, in contradistinction to cows, horses, and sheep the cattle kind. But this spontaneous grouping into kinds is the first essay of the human mind at classification, or the calling by a common name of those things that are alike, and the arranging them in such a manner as best to suggest the sum of their likenesses and unlikenesses to other things those kinds which yet include no other subdivisions than the sexes, or various breeds, are called, in technical language, species. The English lobster is a species, our crayfish is another, our prawn is another. In other countries, 
However, there are lobsters, crayfish, and prawns very like ours, and yet presenting sufficient differences to deserve distinction. Naturalists, therefore, express this resemblance and this diversity by grouping them as distinct species of the same genus. But the lobster and the crayfish, though belonging to distinct genera, have many features in common, and hence are grouped together in an assemblage which is called a family. More distant resemblances connect the lobster and the prawn and the crab, which are expressed by putting all these into the same order. Again, more remote, but still very different resemblances unite the lobster with the woodlouse the king crab, the water flea, and the barnacle, and separate them from all other animals, whence they collectively constitute the larger group, or class, crustacea. But the crustacea exhibit many peculiar features in common with insects, spiders, and centipedes, so that these are grouped into the still larger assemblage or province, articulata, and finally, the relations which those have to worms and other lower animals are expressed by combining the whole vast aggregate into the sub-kingdom of Annulosa. If I had worked my way from a sponge instead of a lobster, I should have found it associated by like ties with a great number of other animals into the sub-kingdom Protozoa. If I had selected a freshwater polyp or a coral, the members of what naturalists term the sub-kingdom Silenterata would have grouped themselves around my type. Had a snail been chosen, the inhabitants of all univalve and bivalve land and water, shells, the lamp shells, the squids, and the sea mat would have gradually linked themselves onto it as members of the same sub-kingdom of mollusca. And finally, starting from man, I should have been compelled to admit first the ape, the rat, the dog, the horse, into the same class and then the bird, the crocodile, the turtle, the frog, and the fish, into the same sub-kingdom of vertebrata. And if I had followed out all of these various lines of classification fully, I should discover, in the end, that there was no animal, either recent or fossil, which did not at once fall into one or other of these sub-kingdoms. In other words, every animal is organized upon one or other of the five or more plans whose existence renders our classification possible. And so definitely and precisely marked is the structure of each animal that, in the present state of our knowledge, there is not the least evidence to prove that a form, in the slightest degree transitional between any of the two groups, vertebrata, annulosa, mollusca, and silenterata, either exists or has existed during that period of the Earth's history which is recorded by the geologist. Nevertheless, you must not for a moment suppose, because no such transitional forms are known, that the members of the sub-kingdoms are disconnected from, or independent of, one another. On the contrary, in their earliest condition, they are all alike, and the primordial germs of a man, a dog, a bird, a fish, a beetle, a snail, and a polyp 
are, in no essential structural respects, distinguishable. In this broad sense, it may with truth be said that all living animals and all those dead creations which geology reveals are bound together by an all-pervading unity of organization, of the same character, though not equal in degree, to that which enables us to discern one and the same plan amidst the twenty different segments of a lobster's body. Truly, it has been said, that to clear eye the smallest fact is a window through which the infinite may be seen. Turning from these purely morphological considerations, let us now examine into the manner in which the attentive study of the lobster impels us into other lines of research. Lobsters are found in all the European seas, but on the opposite shores of the Atlantic and in the seas of the southern hemisphere they do not exist. They are, however, represented in these regions by very closely allied but distinct forms, the Homarus americanus and the Homarus capensis, so that we may say that the European has one species of Homarus, the American another, the African another, and thus the remarkable facts of geographical distribution begin to dawn upon us. Again, if we examine the contents of the Earth's crust, we shall find in the latter of those deposits, which have served us as the great burying grounds of past ages, numberless lobster-like animals, but none so similar to our living lobster as to make zoologists sure that they belonged even to the same genus. If we go still further back in time, we discover, in the oldest rocks of all, the remains of animals, constructed on the same general plan as the lobster, and belonging to the same great group of crustacea, but, for the most part, totally different from the lobster, and indeed from any other living form of crustacean, and thus we gain a notion of that successive change of the animal population of the globe in past ages, which is the most striking fact revealed by geology. Consider now where our inquiries have led us. We studied our type morphologically, when we determined its anatomy and its development, and when comparing it in these respects with other animals, we made out its place in a system of classification. If we were to examine every animal in a similar manner, we should establish a complete body of zoological morphology. Again, we investigated the distribution of our type in space and in time, and, if the like had been done with every animal, the sciences of geographical and geological distribution would have attained their limit. But you will observe one remarkable circumstance, that, up to this point, the question of the life of these organisms has not come under consideration. Morphology and distribution might be studied almost as well, if animals and plants were a particular kind of crystals and possess none of those functions which distinguish living beings so remarkably. But the facts of morphology and distribution have to be accounted for, and the science, whose aim it is to account for them, is physiology. Let us return to our lobster once more. If we match the creature in its native element, 
we should see it climbing actively the submerged rocks, among which it delights to live by means of its strong legs, or swimming by powerful strokes of its great tail, the appendages of whose six joint are spread out into a broad, fan-like propeller. Seize it, and it will show you that its great claws are no mean weapons of offense. Suspend a piece of carrion among its haunts, and it will greedily devour it tearing and crushing the flesh by means of its multitudinous jaws. Suppose that we had known nothing of the lobster but as an inert mass, an organic crystal, and, if I may use the phrase, that we could suddenly see it exerting all these powers. What wonderful new ideas and new questions would arise in our minds? The great new question would be, how does all this take place? The chief new idea would be the idea of adaptation to purpose. The notion that the constituents of animal bodies are not mere unconnected parts, but organs working together to an end. Let us consider the tale of the lobster again. From this point of view, morphology has taught us that it is a series of segments composed of homologous parts, which undergo various modifications, beneath and through which a common plan of formation is discernible. But if I look at the same part physiologically, I see that it is a most beautifully constructed organ of locomotion, by means of which the animal can swiftly propel itself either backwards or forwards.